Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Order of Parting, written by Zalkos. Barrow felt water on his skin, lying on his back with the lake slowly pushing past him. He was content to just let go. The ground against his spines was hard. But the wet, cool waves drowned it out. The aches and the strains in his call seemed to get further and further away with each passing moment. He heard someone coming toward him along the shore. But who would be here? It was Alice gliding towards him. With the golden sunlight streaming past her hair, she was as beautiful as the day she bonded with him. Her bracelets and brooches jangling as she ran, glinting dimly in the afternoon sun off of her green sundress. He wasn't worth her loving smile and gentle patience. Marrow would have to make it up to her somehow. Maybe a vacation to the islands. She came to him then, getting down on her knees as she approached. She leaned over Barrow with that mischievous glint in her eyes, smiling just a little bit as she laid her hands on his chest. As she slid slower and she looked up at him, eyes piercing his. She leaned back, smiled, and opened her lips to say in a lovely voice, Clear! Pain! It rippled across his chest and down his side, a torrent of fervent and angry pain tearing down through his sternum towards his core. Alice seemed to waver in his eyes. As the pain started to focus and grow, his shoulder was aflame, his nerves each trying to demand his focus and attention, each one turning black and made of voices calling out for the release and clear... The torrent ripped and screamed as it made its way through Barrow's body. His legs convulsed as his spines retracted into their paws. Barrow's arms were an inferno feeding off its own shoulder. The world flashed and Alice turned a sickly pink color. Her hair started to condense into a hard sheen, her sundress growing coarse and with odd shapes throughout along the front. The waves turned ugly, less of an ocean, more of an off-blood color. And Barrow began to suspect that they had never been waves at all. Clear! Dylas was banished, reality came into focus, and standing over him was a strange human. It had olive green dermal coverings, dispersing with pockets every nature of any kind. Barrow had never seen so many pockets, in contrast to that, the large red cross on the human's shoulder commanded his attention. Barrow distorted mind, desperately tried to recall human battle companies. He failed. Human! Barrow coughed on blood, trying to clear his throat repeatedly while slowly starting to stand. Ah, the human answered. Guess they were right. You silker bastards just needed an attunement and you get right back up, don't you? Barrow lurched under his weight, the shift allowing him to come to his feet properly. Human, Barrow finally growled out. What battle company are you? Hmm, the human stared. Oh, uh, none, sir. I'm from the monastery about three miles back. Uh, order of the parting, sir. Uh, trying to educate your people on mortality. Then why are you on the battle lines? Barrow answered slowly recovering his memory. Well, uh, quite frankly, I, I wanted to see if it would work, the human answered quickly. If, um, what would work, Barrow said. This, the human said, holding up a strange square object with wires running along it. Barrow noticed some of the connections had fused to the strange device. The human noticed his confusion. This is an AED. It's an automated external defibrillator. Well, uh, not really. This one has been jury-rigged to give high electrical shocks. Not safe for me, but it seemed to work just fine for you. The human exclaimed, smiling. 
Barrow stared at the strange pink thing four feet beneath him. His scales had responded to an electrical pulse, reformed over the large wound on his side and arm, and started mutations to heal immediately. Such a thing was previously known only to happen when the gods graced the planet with thunderstorms. This human had forced it to happen. Well, um, I'll get out of your scales, please, uh, Take it easy. I'd hate to have to meet you again. Good luck, the human said, bounding away towards the hills. Barrow watched the human until the crest of the hill and disappeared. Order of parting. Barrow remembered the rumors about that. A human embassy turned enclave up near the hills. The nickname that he'd heard given was the Order of Death. He had heard very different rumors from the truth, it seemed. Barrow checked himself over finding all his scales well-positioned and in place. A remarkable wonder. He found his rifle laying nearby and started rolling back towards the battle lines proper. The order of parting. Well, he'd have to bring them a gift. When the, the Civil War ended, he thought Alice would like that. End of story. Story number two. Killer Moose, written by Joe Two Underscore Zero. Terrans are very interesting as a species, where any species seek out the safest possible way to do something. Terrans seem to do it in the most dangerous way possible, even when safer options may be available. Helicopters, which they still use 500 years after the advent of cheap civilian VTOL, Chemical rockets, manned fighters, and user-driven automobiles. But it is in the combat arena that they seem to excel in this. Enter the paratroopers. These units were founded before even the helicopter was invented, and the exact reason eludes me. A paratrooper unit is at its core an all-volunteer force, even during times of conscription which gives some level of indication to its danger. Their sole purpose was, believe it or not, is to be flown over or behind enemy and then jump out of planes. The only thing preventing them from splattering against the ground is an inverted bowl-shaped piece of fabric that they are suspended from, which was prepared by an entirely different Terran. And if it fails, which they sometimes do, they have a second which also sometimes fails. And even if neither parachute fails, they can time the opening wrong, land the wrong way, get caught on the mothercraft, or suffer any other number of potential fatal mishaps. If you don't catch any of that, it is utter insanity. In modern times, the Terrans have upped the ante on the danger and doubled down. They deploy exclusively from space now, and are a distinct entity from orbital drop troopers, though both call themselves paratroopers, which caused much confusion when writing this report. The real paratroopers use devices called, rather innocuously, Manual Orbital Operation Security Equipment, or BOOS. What this is, is a single-use, one-person heat shield in which the user lies on their back holding an attitude thruster on a mount much like a machine gun, complete with Terran standard spade grips, facing directly towards the back of the shield. A set of airbags deploy around the user upon launch from the mothercraft, and all the information is displayed upon the visor of the paratrooper's pressure suit. Oh yes, the entire contraption is unpressurized, and so the operator is in a hard vacuum the entire time forgot to mention that. The attitude gun is then used to maintain the facing and correct trajectory of the moose, in order to ensure that he or she does not burn up alongside the ablative coating of the moose. As the back of the moose is unprotected from heat or aerodynamic forces. Yes, you did read that correctly. The back is covered with a shallow conical sheet of canvas in tan 499. Once both speed and heat have dropped to an acceptable levels, a drogue parachute deploys from the back of the moose, and the airbags are deflated, with the entire attitude gun and canvas sheet being ejected. At this point, 
The paratrooper bails out, leaving the attitude gun, canvas, airbag assembly, and heat shield to crash into the ground. At this point, the paratrooper is falling at terminal velocity, delaying the opening of his or her own parachute, a specialized type called a parafoil, capable of significant yaw acceleration, deacceleration, and limited pitch control, until less than one kilometer from the ground. During this period, the paratrooper is significantly less visible on radar and visual scanners than a drop pod. This is the primary advantage of a parachute insertion over an orbital drop pod insertion, and it is absolutely, completely unknown, approximated as fuck as pants on head, grade A, insanity. At this time, despite the offers from Terran Ordnance Bureau, I cannot recommend in good conscience this system to be adopted by the Volker's Orbital Core. The marginally increased safety from enemy action does not, in the, my mind, make up for the significantly increased risk of insertion system itself. And I do not care how badass it sounds. That said, please contact our Terran liaison and see how much groveling it would take to get a few Terran parachute regiments attached to us. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click, click, click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to give a quick thanks to the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia, Barky, Feudic Yol, Cam Maxwell, Casper Onholtz, White Van 420, Lord Asrakal, Arcalian, and Oakfield.